As we had noted, the heart's a pretty important organ. It was named one of the top 10 organs on a recent survey. So let's uh, talk about um, cardiac pharmacology a bit more. So Arthur Jackson is a 67-year-old man. He's retired. He's got a history of a heart attack or an acute MI uh, or anterior MI, however you'd like to use that abbreviation. And he's also status post coronary artery bypass graft, often pronounced cabbage. So he's had cabbage surgery. He's got lots of different things that uh, would have stressed his heart. He's currently on lisinopril 20 milligrams a day, carvedilol 12.5 milligrams twice a day, uh, Lasix or fluorosamide 40 milligrams as needed for swelling, uh, and potassium 8 milli equivalents per day. Uh, the potassium, of course, is there because the furosemide can wash out the potassium in the body. Right now, Arthur's got some shortness of breath. He's coughing up some blood. He's got decreased appetite for a week. Coughing up blood is obviously an ominous sign. It can mean tuberculosis. It can mean lung cancer. There's lots of things it can mean, but it can actually just mean heart failure as well. So Arthur's got to sit, uh, sleep sitting up in a chair, um, basically high Fowler's position if you're still using that terminology. He's got dyspnea on exertion, his shoes and his belt are tight. He eats a pretty high sodium diet, uh, lots of bacon, lots of Chinese food. Um, vital signs show a little bit of a fast heart rate, as well as a relatively low blood pressure. He has been diagnosed with heart failure. Now, heart failure has lots of classification systems that we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about with reduced ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction, but right now we're just going to really talk about the basics. He's got a weak pump. So what happens when the pump fails? Well, in the right heart, the blood comes from the right, uh, uh, from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. When it goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle, it then goes through the pulmonary artery into the lungs. The problem is, is that if there is um, decreased flow in that right side of the heart, it'll back up into the vena cavas and cause pressure. Because of that, it will actually cause pooling out in the periphery. So you'll get uh, swelling into the peripheral circulation, you'll get distended neck veins, the legs will swell up, sometimes even the liver will swell up. The left heart, of course, is um, if the lungs are here, whoops, uh, basically the oxygenated bl bl blood comes from the lungs through the pulmonary vein uh, and basically comes into the left atrium and the left ventricle and then shoots out the left ventricle out the aorta into the bloodstream. Now if you have failure of this left side of the heart it's going to back up into the lungs and what do you get for symptoms? You get shortness of breath, you can get hemoptysis, it's not real common but it can happen um, and you'll actually get some changes in the auscultation of the lungs as well. You'll start to get some crackles uh, you'll get evidence that there's blood pooling back there. The lower oxygen that's shooting out of the aorta and getting to the periphery can cause fatigue, weakness, and even cyanosis in some cases. Now we talk about left-sided and right-sided heart failure, but you probably can imagine that eventually if you've got enough backup, the other side of the heart will be affected. So in most cases, uh, even though heart failure may pre be predominantly left-sided or right-sided, it tends to affect the whole heart. And we don't tend to make a big discrimination between left-sided and heart failure and right-sided heart failure except in the acute uh, situation. When the heart starts to fail, you almost get a little bit shock-like. Um, you know, the blood pressure is hard to maintain because you don't have that pump effect. Uh, stroke volume is going down. Uh, and you basically have those same effects. So what does the body do? The same thing it does with low blood pressure. It activates the sympathetic nervous system. The heart rate goes up. It'll clamp down on the peripheral arteries. The renin angiotensin system kicks in. You'll start to retain fluid. You'll start to clamp down on your arteries. 
and all of those things will basically increase the preload um, short term that'll increase the stroke volume um, because of the Frank Starling mechanism you got more blood flow coming back to the heart the problem is that the heart will eventually start to hypertrophy you know you'll end up with thickening of the wall um, because not only do you have a better stroke volume but you've got increased peripheral resistance that it's fighting against um, which is basically increased afterload all of these help for the short run over the long run they actually lower cardiac function because you've got that increased afterload um, you end up with you know a shorter filling time because the heart rate goes up you know the blood pressure goes up so you get increased afterload and you've got uh, increased hypertrophy um, which works better for a little while but eventually the muscle gets so big that it actually starts to work less well so you end up with a heart which is just straining itself all the time and will fail even more so what we do now um, is we basically try to decrease the cardiac needs and make the heart more efficient how do we do that uh, we decrease preload by giving ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, we often give diuretics as well although that's usually third or fourth line we decrease afterload the ACE inhibitors will actually do both so they're great medicines for heart failure uh, and beta blockers and maybe even alpha blockers will also decrease that afterload alpha blockers will cause a bit of a peripheral vasodilatation um, beta blockers also decrease oxygen need for the heart so um, what else can we do for heart failure I tend to avoid the term CHF even though I used it here um, because not all heart failure is congestive so just be careful using that term uh, we can restrict sodium exercise will actually improve circulation uh, make the heart more efficient uh, although it's often very hard to do with a patient with heart failure another thing to think about is the b natriuretic peptide so when a patient goes into heart failure their body starts producing b nat p uh, we can use this number to tell how bad the heart failure is by measuring it in the blood we basically do a blood test which measures b nat p the other thing we can do now is we can actually give a medicine which basically slows down the metabolism of bnp um, usually we measure nt pro bnp which is not affected um, by this medicine but regular bnp is so the blood test actually should not be affected by uh, this medicine the medicine i'm talking about is entresto entresto has a, a medicine called secubitril in it uh, secubitril actually is a naprilicin blocker it actually blocks the hormone which breaks down bnp it may be doing other things as well it may be breaking down ANP CNP other things um, but we know that the outcomes with Entresto are actually better than the outcomes with just um, an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin blocker interestingly when they first developed this medicine they added it to an ACE inhibitor unfortunately with an ACE inhibitor because uh, Secubitril will increase bradykinin all of these people got angioedema uh, so they did switch it to an angiotensin receptor blocker uh, which doesn't increase bradykinin and so they didn't get angioedema and so now uh, with this combination of medicines does seem to have substantially better outcomes in heart failure so drugs of the week potassium furosemide lisinopril carvedilol spironolactone and entresto so uh, enjoy there's several of the other commercial videos that uh, I also will be adding that uh, do um, explain these things further